All right, we are recording right. now. We are. <laughs> so we're going to talk about being a Catholic family man. I know that's one of the things we were going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess from my perspective, um, and sometimes I'm reminded of this as well from my kids, my first vocation is my wife and children. So sometimes when I'm over here doing recording, and I also write as well, I have a Pathos blog, right. Catholic stand and all that good stuff. And sometimes those things i'm like okay i have to get this out i have to get, get to get this out and then the daughter's like dad did you do your morning prayers today i'm like bam all right perfect thank you for the reminder so i don't know what it's like for you i don't know what it's like for you maybe you can share your your perspective <laughs> yeah um so i have my daughter is only nine months so she's still not there yet but i hope that you know like with your daughter that she she does that too it's i think that routine and more than anything, establishing a healthy routine. Um, but for me, uh, I work in behavioral health. So <clears throat> uh, for the most part, I'm a case manager for a nonprofit agency. And I wake up around five o'clock about uh, Tuesday through Friday. Those are my work days. And I've like learned that to establish a healthy training routine or a healthy spiritual routine, is to establish it's just, you know for more than anything put effort into it and with this pandemic it's been really hard uh, because now churches are closed and you know all that so what i've done even before the pandemic i would use the time that i go to work to pray so uh, it takes me about 40 minutes to get to work and i would just continue, <clears throat> excuse me i would um pray about uh, a mystery give or take mm -hmm. and then after the mystery, I would offer it up to, uh, for, you know, for right now, more than anything, the, the pandemic, um, the victims that are, that are surrounded by this, the families, and just kind of do that, like do a lot of intercessions for different saints, depending on the, on the day, or just in general, Jesus, uh, our Mother Mary, and, and just kind of go from there. So that's what I've done so far, um, because just everything that's been going on, I I felt like the church not being active in, uh, and not, at least not being able to go to church has, has thrown off our circles a little bit, our, our routine. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, I think, one of the biggest challenges, but also the biggest blessings is in this case that I can still pray, you know, even if it's small, but, you know, it's, it's something. Right, and, I th and I think a lot of people um, get caught up in that. If they don't realize how much time they have to actually pray. Like you said, you have that yeah. 40 minute drive. Driving is a perfect opportunity to pray. Now, don't get me wrong, don't close your eyes and do it while you're driving. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you, I mean, you still have that opportunity. I mean, um, I don't know on, on Twitter, um, I don't know if you follow him or not, but he's oh, the, man. <laughs> James, James, James Kramer. He's the Lego, Lego, pro, Lego church project. He builds oh, okay. cathedrals out of Legos. And if you talk to him, he's like, everything I do when I'm doing this is a prayer. Like I'm laying a brick. I'm praying the divine mercy. I'm praying the rosary. I'm praying for people I ran into along the way. And his message is so powerful because it's just, it's, it's a great reminder because everything we do can be a prayer, you know, pray without ceasing. Like St. Paul says in first in first Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. and so, so I think that's just a, a powerful reminder. Like you said, on, on, on that drive. How yeah. many of us, how many of us have commutes, right? We all have commutes of some kind, whether it's five minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. I remember my dad growing up, I grew up in the Los Angeles area. He had an hour long commute right. and wow. there's always, always time to pray. It's just a matter of us making time and realizing that we have the time to do it. Now, right. I guess no, what oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, you know, it's, and I think also, um, because I, it's a, about 40 minutes in and then coming back, it's about like 40, 45 also. And I, I don't pray coming back. I don't know. I, I think for me, and I don't know if, if any other people feel this way, but I think um, I'm kind of like a very habitual person. I establish one thing and I just kind of stick to it. And I feel like I pray in the morning and then coming back, I don't really pray at all other than, um, do maybe uh, the sign of the cross and, and that's it with my wife. We, we kind of go back and forth. We either pray a, like a good mystery in the, at night or we don't. And I think it's also, um, 
because of not establishing that routine. And in this case, it's uh, the discipline part of the spirituality because I know that discipline is also kind of seen as a negative thing, but I think also it's seen as a positive. So yeah, I, I think that's part of my, uh, my experience there is I only pray in the morning and I think that's just to get the day started. Um, but at night it's, I think a whole different level, you know, but that's where at least I'm at right now. Well, that routine is important though. I mean, that that's like you said, is what gets the day started and I'm a, I'm a convert. I don't know if you know my story or not, but what I was taught as a, as a Protestant as well is, you know, establish that routine, go to the same place every day. Uh, to read read the Bible and to pray because eventually it just becomes a habit and you have to do it or else your day just doesn't seem right. And there's right. nothing there's nothing wrong with that routine. Routines are good, especially when it comes to God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything anything else that maybe you, you do? Now you said you don't you don't pray on the way home. Do you reflect on your day? Now you're in behavioral health, so you have a stressful job, of course. Yeah. Um... You know, it, it's it's up and down with the day with the jobs because um, you know there's some good days and there's some bad days. The good days are usually where I meet all my um, all my clients and we work on whatever whatever task they want, whatever objectives they need help with, either going to a doctor's appointment or so forth. But I think that and I you know this week uh, two weeks ago actually when I came back from work um, for those that don't know. I, my family and I were struck with COVID, so we were at, we were in quarantine for a little bit. Um, but after work, um, I was just happy to go back to work because I, I think you want to stay at home, but when you stay at home for unforcefully, it's a whole different level. You know, there's, there's only so many things you can do, and right. so I'm glad just to get back to my regular routine. But uh, I had a person that passed away that I worked with for a while, a client of mine, and and we. And I say we because uh, I was working with the sister. His sister was very involved with his life and trying to help him out. Um, and this is a gentleman late in uh, late fifties, and it it was really tough because I've experienced this situation before. But um, when he passed away, I talked to the sister. We we pretty much talked about what was going on, what happened, and I had I was driving when I was talking to her, um, and so. I'll, she had to let me go because that's when she started crying and, you know, it kind of hit her towards the end. And I was like, you know what? Um, it's, it's going to be, a, it's a definitely be, not going to be easy, but I gave her some resources to use like grief support and things like that. And then I, I pulled over on my way to, to my um, to the office where I work at. And um, for the most part, I took some time just to, to cry it out, you know, um, because I think more than anything, when you work in behavioral health and, and really any any field, but when you like hold things in, in this case, like your feelings, that as a guy, you're not supposed to cry or, or you know, from what I, people are usually, or what guys are, right. Um, right. what's that, you know, the stigma on that, or the, not sorry, the stereotype, but I think it's okay to, to let it out, to, to have a healthy emotional health. And, um, and more than anything, I, you know, pulled over and, you know, I didn't like, cry like forever and sob and but it was more like just to let it out I think it was that moment of just letting it through and giving myself time to rebuild um you know broke, break myself and then heal myself and then after that I I offered you know um God just his, you know this person's um soul I mean he might not be religious but for me at least for as a Catholic to say you know like I um, I hope that where he wherever he goes is in a better state, um, you know, and and more than anything, his family uh, to help his family heal his sister, and then that was it. You know, that was this very small prayer. I I started out with, I think, you know, one of the, the most um, powerful words that you can do as a prayer is dear Lord or, you know, hey Lord. I think, you know, that's that's a start, and um, and yeah, and. Uh, I pray that when there's good days that I'm thankful for those good days. And when there's bad days, I'm, I'm thankful that there's bad days, but when anything to help me reflect on what happened and to build up, you know, to help me stay strong emotionally, but also know that when I'm weak, um, that I need him. I need God. And, uh,
uh, I need as much help as I can. Uh, divine intervention, I guess you can say. So, so you know, good days and then bad days. I, I just remember to pray for if anything, um, ask for help. You know, ask for to face these in, these situations because many people might go through this and sometimes um, don't ask for help. You know, and I think it's okay, always okay to ask for help, especially from you know our Father above that He's always watching and that's what He wants. He wants us to help Him. You know, or to ask for help. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, you, you talked about that stereotype how men aren't supposed to cry and my son brought this up maybe two three months ago because to be honest the kids are being affected by this pandemic as well they can't be <clears throat> kids really because they're stuck inside but um he's he's 12 and he, he started crying and he's like dad i'm sorry for crying i'm like dude i call him dude that's my nickname for him, dude. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it, it's okay. I mean, and I, I remind him, you know, Jesus cried. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I think we should lose sight of that. It's okay to show emotion. And don't get me wrong, we, we need to be that rock for our family as well. But there's also that time where, I mean, we're, hu we're human. I mean, we have to remember that. So let me ask you, I'm, I'm going to ask you an, another question because yeah. I, I noticed this as well. When you don't do, if something happens and you don't get your morning prayer in, how does that affect the rest of your day? That's a good question. I think um, with with the quarantine, you know, we prayed, but it wasn't the same anymore. Like it was, like in the mornings we would wake up and we were just happy that we were alive uh, because, you know, you don't really know. And more than anything, um, I I broke my whole routine. I think I felt kind of awkward. I felt like I, it feels like when you wear a shoe and it doesn't fit right, it feels kind of awkward. You know, it either fits really tight or really loose. And uh, and that's kind of how it felt. Like I wasn't doing what I would usually do. I would establish, I would wake up at five, do you know my breakfast, get it ready and then leave by six, um, hopefully on time. And then I'll right away, you know, do the, um, the sign of the cross and, mm -hmm father and kind of go from there and I felt like like I, I like drinking green tea, green tea in the morning and I felt like with the prayer like I got a boost of caffeine you know I got a spiritual caffeine because it helped me wake up and establish what to do and then right after I would listen to a podcast or something just so I read uh, that way I can kind of continue just having something and sometimes I would find myself that I would pray for more than 20 minutes because um, I don't know if it happens to you but I start praying and I get distracted because I see a car that's trying to swerve or something or just whatever and then I kind of keep going and I forget like did I do how many uh, um, what do you call it um, Hail Mary did I do already and then I just keep going and keep going and then I was like okay I think I hit about 20 or 10 miles into my road to my um commute and then I was just like I think I'm I'll just offer up the rest of the stuff you know why whatever my intentions are to to God or whatever and so yeah I think if I don't pray I I feel a little bit awkward spiritually awkward um and I don't know if that's a good if that's a good term to say but for me at least that's how I feel I feel like I'm not I'm not there yet I'm not uh comfortable you know <clears throat> I do the, I do the liturgy of the hours in the morning okay um it's something I've found that I just enjoy it because I, I I love reading scripture and it's all scripture that you're reading and it's formed into a into a prayer. But mm -hmm. what I what I found is that on those days where I don't get it, I, I don't have a chance to do it before everyone gets up, I get really irritable halfway through the day. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and this is the funny part. So sorry, is it my, that's when my seven year old daughter reminds me, Dad, did you do your morning prayers today? And it's that reminder. It's like I, it's like I feel bad that she has to remind me, but at the same time, I'm so I'm so thankful that she reminds me. I remember one morning, she's eating breakfast and she's like, "Dad, did you do your morning prayers today?" And it's like, "Honey, I haven't done it yet." She's like, "Well, why don't you go in your room and do it because we have our breakfast. We're okay." <laughs> and she said that on behalf of the four kids, and like they all just like kicked me out of the room. But it's like they know as well that I have to have that prayer time. I have to have that time with God or else it just throws my day off. Right. And I just, I let the day get a hold of me and, and it's not something I'm proud of, but 
Um, right, right. I mean, let's be honest. We're, we're human. Yeah. We, we get, we get overcome with everything going on. And I'm thankful that my, my kids recognize that. So I'm sorry. I was curious how, how it affects your routine if you missed it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think, um, you know, it, it does get uncomfortable, you know, it's kind of like wearing a shoe that doesn't fit right. Yeah. It's just going to be weird the rest of the day. And that I feel like I'm, I'm, um, I'm always, especially if I'm late to something, like if I'm late to work, um, I, I might have skipped my routine. So what I try to do is maybe I'll listen to um, a rosary on YouTube. Because uh, for me, I, 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 I know prayers, but I'm not very knowledgeable of what to pray, how to pray, I guess, the, the, the structure of it. My wife is really good about it. Um, she knows how to like, do all the prayers and stuff. But I, I'm more of a uh, research kind of person. I like to learn about scripture, about the figures and things like that. You know, her thing is praying and all that. She like I, she doesn't like to read. I do. So I'm always about reading and all this stuff. But um, yeah, I, you know, I think it's it becomes um, a little bit unhealthy, a little bit spiritually awkward for me, I guess. And but I, something that you, that you said is that even though your, your daughter reminds you, I mean, that, that comes from a long time, like a lot of, um, I would say, uh, instilling, you know, like what do you, or what have you done with your daughter then that with your kids uh, to that point that they remind you because kids don't really just, you know, um, they're born and they start learning how to walk and all that and talk, but they, you know, about God, they don't know. I mean, I know that um, they're, you know, God said, or Jesus says that, let the kids come on to me, but how do we, as parents, how do you, how do you teach your kids about God? Because I think that's beautiful that they remind you, even though, you know, some people might see it as not a good thing, but I think it's that, you know, that thing that you do um, since they're kids is instilling that, you know, something that we, as parents, we, I think, uh, you know, I'm a young parent, but my, my dad, you know, he, we, I was kind of like, it was more traditional. He didn't talk to me about God, it was mostly by my mom. And uh, my dad would talk about the other things like, uh, you know, I don't know, like yard work and doing all the chores and mm -hmm. having man stuff and all that. And that was good too, because that, that instills discipline and structure and all that. But for, as a father, um, how did you, like, what would you do with your kids to have, you know, to that point that now they're reminding you, but, you know, working with them on the spirituality and just knowing about God and, and all that. I realize that I'm the example for them. And so, and it, and it goes back to my background as well as, as a Protestant, you know, I had all those misconceptions yeah. about Catholics, right? You know, Catholics don't read scripture, don't pray, whatever, all wrong, all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I resolved that I think about six years ago, that one, my children will never have the opportunity to say that we didn't have a bible in the house because i'm mm -hmm. kind of one i'm kind of a bible collector i have bibles all over the place i'm surrounded by them right now but <laughs> um but they why i love reading it and i read it to them and so mm -hmm. from a young age i started off with the you know the picture bibles the children's bibles all those cool oh, yeah, things yeah. that are all those cool things that are out there for kids and so i still that in them the love of scripture the love of prayer now, going to church is such a great thing because Jesus loves us so much. He died on the cross for our sins. I tell that to them as often as possible. Right. I, I remind that with them. I, I pray with, and since, I don't know, ever since I can remember, we, we pray every night. Um, whether it be a Hail Mary and, and or, or Glory Be. And then from there, I'll say just, you know, what do you want to pray for? Mm -hmm. and they'll say, you know, my friend, my teacher. So we say a prayer for what they're thinking of as well. And I just, I try to be that example. And then um, it's not always easy, but I've always tried to be that example. My wife tries to be that example. My, my wife is kind of the opposite. My, my wife, is, my wife grew up in the church. She's a cradle Catholic. Okay. But at the same time, she'll talk about the faith, but she's not very comfortable doing it as well. Um. And, and, and she knows it's what I'd love to do. It's like my passion. And so whenever the kids have a question, they like, okay, well, here's what I think, but go ask dad. 
<laughs> no, go, go ask dad. And so we'll, we'll just have a conversation. I think it's part of just being open, letting your kids know that if you ever have a question about what we believe or about what you see at church, ask. And so I've always encouraged my kids since whenever we're in mass, if there's something, if there's something you don't understand why we do it, ask me, ask me right then, or I'll should forget later on. And so I'll explain it to them. And this happened a couple of weeks ago um, during the Eucharistic prayer. My nine-year-old daughter, I have four kids. Um, my my nine-year-old daughter had a question about the, she's like, it was during the Eucharistic prayer. And she's like, dad, so why, why do we do this? Why do we do that? And I forget exactly what the question was. Um, but I was like, well, that what the priest just said is actually out of the Bible. And this is what, oh, it was take, take my body know the core part i don't know how i spaced out on that but (laughs) i was like well it goes back to the last supper that's what jesus said and so the priest is repeating the words of jesus because even though the priest is up there he's saying it's in persona christi and i kind of explained that she's like oh okay so i've just i've always i've always instilled in my kids ask the questions if you have does there's no dumb question just ask it there's an answer for it I think that's important. If, no matter if you're grow, if you're a child or if you're an adult looking into the faith, ask the question because there's always right. going to be an answer for it. And so to answer your a long way of answering your question is I've just always done those little things with my kids. That's um, good. Starting off with the picture Bibles, the prayers, and now they all have their own Bible as well. And we'll read a story from their own Bible. And it's not a picture Bible, it's an actual okay. actual Bible now. So we kind of graduated and we still have those picture Bibles because they'll, they'll, they'll go back and they'll read them, which is mm-hmm. great, which is great. And it's like, you see a lot and all these picture Bibles have the passages that the story is taken from. So I was like, if you want to look at the, if you want to read the whole story instead of a summary, you can go here and I show them how to do it. Go to the table of contents, find the book and, and read it. All right. and, and so when you go back to my daughter, how she reminds me to yeah. do the morning prayer um that's kind of where that stems from if i've just instilled in them to one always pray if you're feeling worried about something uh pray if you're happy about something always give thanks yeah that's what it stems from yeah you know and i think um now that i think about it too is that I might not, I'm, I just pray like, uh, you know, my routine in the morning, but I, I, for some reason, I, again, it's because it's a routine, uh, praying before meals, you know, like thanking God for the meals, even for me, because I, you know, where I work at, I don't want to um, make it uncomfortable if there's people, but so I do like a really quick, you know, um, sign of the cross. And then in my mind, you know, I'm thinking, you know, thank God for, for the food and this and that. And and then, you know, I eat my meal. Um, I know some people think God right after. I think uh, I, that's something that, again, it's not instilled in me, but it's still something good to do. I, I don't uh, disagree with people that if they, you know, pray before their meal and then after their meal, that's that's good. Um, but I'm, I'm just glad that I pray before the meal, even if it's a quick prayer, just because, I, again, more than anything, it's uh, gratefulness. And even if it's... Um, something small but going back to your you know with your kids i think that's awesome that you can instill that using kind of and i I like that you mentioned like a graduation level like you start out with picture bibles and then you go on to like more of the heavier items like in this case the books without pictures because i think books without pictures might not be the most exciting but um it allows your imagination to grow because now you imagine it rather than having it there for you but uh, you know, I, I think that's awesome having, you know, having your way of instilling that and, and it goes back to the, I guess, the general term, domestic church, you know, even though there's not a regular church right now, but I think the most important, and one of my priest, um, priest friends told me, the most important um, church that you can have as a Catholic is your domestic church, because from family, it goes on to the next level of, you know, community and service and all that, and if your domestic church is struggling, you might be struggling in other areas too. And, uh, and so I, I think that term domestic church is one of the best things that when, I, since I've, um, since I began more reading into the faith of, 
learning more about the faith is taking care of your own, kind of your own tribe, you know? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very important term because I mean, at, at mass we're sent. And in my mind, that's just the beginning. Okay. At the, at the end of mass, you know, the, the priest or the deacon, you know, the mass has ended, go forth in peace, the love and serve the Lord. Right. That's the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't go back to our lives, how they were before. Um, we go back to learn, to put in practice what we just learned to make our lives better and uh, spread the gospel and that gospel, like you said, with the domestic church, it begins in our family and then it goes outward everywhere else. So, and I know you're, you're a new father. You're, you're, you have a nine month old. What, what do you, you and your wife do as far as the domestic church goes? So we, um, so I, a little story about us too is that uh, we met in, in the church, in the faith. Uh, we met in a youth retreat about, I want to say like about six years now. It's going to be oh, uh, cool. five, five, six years, you know? So we started dating for, we dated for about two, two, two to three years. And so I'm just happy that um, more than anything, and I, we always talk about this for the most part because we forget, you know, we, the pandemic hits, uh, work, she's working a lot. I'm working, you know, my usual hours, sometimes a lot, sometimes less. I go to school. I'm finishing up in December. I'm um, doing my master's in social work. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and, and so we're, we're busy, you know, um, our families taking care of each other, all this stuff. And, and we forget about where we actually met, you know, we, it, it's nice that, uh, and that's, I did a recent episode on just the faith and how I got there and stuff. And every time I talk about this, um, it, and I, I, I think I uh, replied on someone's tweet about how they met their wives or how they met their partners. And um, I think I wrote, uh, my wife thought I was weird when she first met me. We had no intention of dating because I was a helper. I was just there and just, you know, doing, um, helping people out, helping the youth and the new people that were coming in. And so she, she didn't think I, you know, anything of, of me. And she just thought I was a weird person because I was friendly to her. You know, she had bad experiences with guys and it kind of, you know, you notice that when people have bad experiences, like they, they build this barrier. Right. And, um, since then we've always stayed together praying. We would go to church a lot. And we, uh, when, when I was not as busy, I guess now before, when I was single, uh, or when we were dating, I, I was a lecturer at a church. Um, I would read, and that was awesome. I, I enjoyed reading. Um, you know, during quarantine, I was reading uh, Jim Sano's uh, book because I had a lot of time, so I'm like, I got to do something, you know, and and I enjoyed it. Um, and so we would do reading. She would do reading, too, at her church, and on the weekends, we'd go to church together and kind of go from there. Um, but in marriage, it's a whole different ballgame. It's, it's awesome, but it's challenging in its own, and we we would pray sometimes i'm not gonna lie i'm gonna be honest we sometimes we would not pray sometimes because having a baby and her uh, she was pregnant right away so it was a lot of challenges with that um and then a lot of personal challenges for myself and i needed to get myself restructured and kind of know myself as they say know thyself and so now um we might not pray as much but if anything, I always pray for us. She might pray on her own too, but I always, you know, offer our prayers or my prayers to to God for the people, for the pandemic, you know, all that, and then also for us, her family, my family. Um, and once in a while, we'll pray like a quick mystery, you know, not a lot. And, and we've had our, our systems all over the place because we don't have church, you know, we don't we don't go to church. And sometimes having a baby and watching a YouTube. Uh, what do you call it, recording or watching mass on YouTube, it's kind of hard, you know, the baby's running all over the place, you don't, you know, you don't hear the, the message, and you're like, oh, you know, then you miss, and I mean, yeah, you can go back and re-record it, but when there's a baby, it, it's just hard, you know, so I would say that we, we try, you know, we, we're kind of like lukewarm, but I know that's not what we need to be, but, you know, we're, I think as long as we, individ, even though, you know, as they say, uh, couples that pray together stay together. I think if you pray for your couple or your partner, I think it, it's helpful, you know. 
in a way. So that's kind of what we do. Uh, what do you guys do now? Well, my wife and I have been married for 15 years. And oh, wow. we, we met while I was active duty in the Army. I was a chaplain assistant in the Army. And okay. we, I, and so I was managing the main post chapel. Oh, and there, sure. and nice. there, was a, there was an event there. And it's a funny story because my mother-in-law kept coming, well, my future mother-in-law and her friend say, you need to come meet my daughter. I'm like, no, I'm doing this paperwork. I have to get it ready for the commander. <laughs> and, she, and she's like, okay. And she came back an hour later. You need to come meet my daughter. I'm like, I'm, I'm still doing this paperwork, Judy. I can't. She's like, all right, fine. And she's like, I'm not, and she back, maybe another hour later. I'm not taking no for an answer. Come meet my daughter. I'm like, all right, fine. Go meet her, go meet, meet my future wife, which was pretty cool. But a funny story real quick. Um, we go to my mother-in-law's house because they invited me over just for a quick little bite to eat afterward. And remember the old game system, the GameCube by Nintendo? Oh, yeah. Nice. My mother-in-law was like, can you hook up my Playboy? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this girl I just met who's going to become my wife later on was like mortified, like, oh my gosh, mom. <laughs> like, no, but um, we, we honestly, you, you said something, pray for your wife, pray for your spouse. That's something we should all do. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to do that. Um, absolutely. And, we, and we, when, we, when we first had our our son who's 12 now we struggled with going to church as well it's just so hard you're getting used to the new routine you're not sleeping a whole lot you're still That's working true. um we just honestly we um we resolved one day just to stick with it just keep going it didn't when I mean, we would no normally go to the 9 30 mass and sometimes mm -hmm. we would just go to a later one sometimes yeah. it wouldn't even be at our normal parish so we just said we're gonna go we're gonna go on sunday this is what our routine is going to be. This is what we're going to show our kids that it's, it's, it's important. And now our kids are like, okay, we have to go to mass tomorrow at nine 30. We have to go to bed by this time. And don't get me wrong. Sometimes there's fights or sometimes it's like, <laughs> it's sometimes it's, or sometimes something happens. Someone has a bad dream. They're up late and say, like, okay, we'll go to 1130. Yeah. And so no matter what, we're just going to go to mass. Sometimes it's been the five o'clock mass on Sunday. Yeah. So my wife and I would pray for each other and we resolved a long time ago that no matter what happens, we are going to go to a mass somewhere on the weekend um, just to make sure our kids know that it's important. That's what get our, let's get our week started off properly. And Jesus has blessed us with so much that he's only asking us for an hour a week. Right. And so that's kind of what we want to do and still, and it took a few years to get there. I mean, yeah. Like I said, we've been married for 15 years. I mean, oh, I mean, I mean, I'll be honest. Our, we didn't get our son, our oldest son baptized till he was 18 months old. I mean, that's how like our schedule was so messed up. Yeah. Um. But for anyone listening, I would say stick with it. The devil's going to try to hamper you. He doesn't want you to go. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to go to mass. He doesn't want you to teach the kids your faith. But um, just. You know, ask for God's grace. God will give it to you, and um, you know we'll stick it to the evil one. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, more than anything, it's it's important that um, you know if and I know there's couples out there that that might be one's a Catholic, one's and maybe their partner is not a Catholic. You know, they're or maybe they're like a lukewarm Catholic or or just you know traditional um, or what they call a Sino. You know, Catholic in, in name or Catholic only in name, I think, or coin, I'm sorry, coin. Right. Um, and so it, it's hard, you know, I know that not everyone is as religious as, you know, you know, maybe the next person, but I think if anything, you know, yeah, I think there's that part of respect. You respect your partner's side and, and don't try to convert the person by trying to like force them into it, you know. If anything, conversion goes through example, I think. And um, when you are a strong person, a good person, and by good, I mean not like being perfect, but recognizing your mistakes, taking ownership, and and with family, it's, you know, and I know uh, with kids, it can be hard. Sometimes they want to go to church. Sometimes they don't, you know, football games on or, you know, whatever is, you know, um, whatever the situation. But I think being patient, you know, and, you um, and just do what you can, if anything, instilling. And um, and I know because, like, when I, 
when I grew up, my parents, we would go to the church traditionally, like every weekend. Um, my mom, super into it, uh, you know, but still what we would pray together every, every night, even though I, I didn't like it, we would always pray with my parents and my, my sister, she, she knows about the faith, but she doesn't go into, um, she doesn't, you know, practice, if anything, a lot, but I think she started practicing a little bit more now because my, uh, my godson, um, we, my wife and I, before we actually dated or before we actually got married, we became her, um, his godparents and, um, and through him, because it's funny, he, he prays on his own with my parents. He knows who Jesus Christ will point and say, oh, this is Mother Mary. And every time I see him, unfortunately, I haven't seen him in a while because of the COVID situation. But um, when, um, before I leave, uh, you know, I tell him, oh, you know, give me your blessing. And all you like do is a little quick thing, but it's just beautiful that he does it, you know, because how many kids do we know that, that can pray or do something like that compared to like knowing more about, you know, um, like games like, uh, Fortnite, they know how to do the dances, they know how to play video games, they know how to, all these other figures, but yet when it comes to the main main uh, character in our lives, they don't, and uh, and I would say, you know, take take time with with, uh, with church and do your best, um, because I, it, it's hard right now, um, and especially now, there's not churches open, and and there could be a lot of division, uh, I know there's been a little struggle with us uh, in our family because of that, and and it was COVID and it, it, it was just, it's, it's breaking our routine. And I think this year is a challenge. It's really, I think more than anything this year is gonna build, uh, it's gonna bring out the worst of you or it's gonna bring out the best of you. Oh, most definitely. And it's funny, and I wanna go back to what you said a minute ago yeah. um, with um, couples that have mixed faiths, you know, Protestant, <laughs> Catholic. When I met my wife, I was a Protestant. And I became Catholic, well, one, because it's what she was, but I went through a situ a thing later on where I just didn't, there were things I didn't believe. And so even though I was still going to mass with her, I, yeah. for all intents and purposes, I wasn't Catholic. Okay. I was just yeah. going to mass with her because it's important. It was important to her. Right. She never pushed me. Um, I expressed my objections and she's like, you'll find the answers. Just keep digging and she just kept her and her mom just kept praying and eventually i came around as i like, okay i texted her one day from the, i remember i'm texting her from the parking lot at work because i worked at a bank at the time and we were waiting to open oh, okay. we're, we were waiting to open and i texted her i'm like i'm sorry um sorry you know for putting you through all this because yeah. it's not it's not easy for that other person either oh yeah and she, she's like, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm all in now. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm Catholic. I'm going to, I'm going to go to confession and all that stuff. And she's like, okay, great. I knew you'd come around. I just, you had to find the answers for yourself. And so she just kept praying. And so definitely keep praying. Don't give up. The Holy Spirit will work through your example. The Holy Spirit's going to work through your example, no matter what. Right. Um, for some will take longer than others, but just stick with it. Mm -hmm. like, kind, of, kind of like St. Monica was St. Augustine. Okay, I mean, how many times did St. Monica pray for St. Augustine to come to the faith? Yeah. I mean, a long time. And now he's doctor of the church and revered the world over, <laughs> east yeah. and west, east and west. So just stick with it. Yeah, and I think more than anything is, um, you know, the word, I, I guess, that describes a lot of this is patience and empathy, something that I think as humans, we don't have anymore. And the reason I say is because um, ever since I got into Twitter, you yeah. know, I, I wanted to spread the gospel, right? Or at least kind of connect with people, like in this case with yourself, uh, which I'm really thankful for. And, and for all the people that I've been, you know, working with and following, you know, as much as I follow um, conservatives, I also like, like to follow the, the other side, liberals, which I think we like to label a lot, you know? I feel like we should just say people because I've known people that went from one side of the spectrum to another, but, you know, anyways, um, there's just been a lot of attacks, and I think, and I tell my mom, I'm like, you know, there's, we see a lot of things that are happening with the pandemic, but there's so many other things behind doors that we don't really see until you go online, you know, there's some, so many people that think this pandemic is uh, conspiracy, they call it the pandemic, and 
and all these things. And I'm thinking, you know, whatever it is, I really find out like years later that it's fake or it was something else. But we took precautions rather than you know, we lose one. Like in my my wife's family, they lost a family member from COVID um, in Mexico, and. You would think like in Mexico, like it's just spreading, you know, um, especially over in, in other places that the remote places that don't have good clinics like here, at least we have uh, the privilege of having a lot of clinics around testing sites and medication that Tylenol, which is basically, you know, something that's over the counter has been, you know, big uh, help and other people can't even afford that. So I think if anything, we should be really thankful for the things that we can have easy access you know right there and um and so I, I see a lot of division in twitter and it's really sad because um uh, i see people encourage people to do things and you know not take care of themselves or follow other things and and it's even the worst part is that it's within the own faith you know even like catholics of their of really strong catholics really good influencers but yet they're dividing things and uh, it's just sad to see that you know and especially if you're a parent and how do you tell your kids you know, don't follow that person or don't listen to that person when, like, you know, they're strong and they, they have a, group, a good um, overall representation of the faith, but yet one of those things is they do other things. And so it, it's hard, I think, uh, right now, um, trying to be a parent, trying to be a good partner, uh, a good spouse when, you know, ideologies kind of come around and clash, I think, more than anything. In this case, like, even having... Protestant background. Um, I see even good Catholics that have different ideologies and they break within their own faith, you know, because it, it could be considered um, maybe extreme for some cases. All right, you mentioned you mentioned Twitter, and that's a whole different animal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I write for. I have a column on Pathios. Okay. And, and Pathios has a lot of, I want, I hate using this label, uh, liberal yeah. writers, but also has a share of conservative writers as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're all, we're all labeled, especially on Twitter with some of the more traditional Catholics. I'll just say yeah. that I'm not going to name names. Right, right. As <laughs> all of us being these liberal, progressive, borderline schismatics, and that's not the case. And so I think when we take the time to sit down and understand where the other person is coming from, um, we, we can, we can get a better perspective because oftentimes, like, like you said, you're either one extreme or the other extreme where the reality is it's probably somewhere in the middle and there's probably some common ground we can meet on somewhere. Right. But it's just the matter of getting, getting through that initial, block if you will and having a discussion a civil one it's yeah, not, I think civil. and i know on twitter on twitter that's not that's something i've always strived to do on twitter I, yeah. I know a lot, a, and unfortunately with twitter controversy creates likes and retweets and everything else and mm -hmm. those are the ones we see the most based on algorithms but i think on twitter there's a lot of people out there that are trying to see both sides and i've been blessed on twitter as well to meet a lot of great people um, like yourself, um, the Lego, oh, yeah. the, the Lego church project guy, uh, yeah. for example, he's a great guy as well. And I've met so many great people on Twitter. It is a great resource. You just have to weed through those two extremes. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's a challenge. Um, because I think, you know, we, we try to unite the church is all about uniting. And unfortunately there's been a lot of division, um, and more than anything, and I, don't, I, I think it can be a, a mix of like the, the book Pride and Prejudice. Um, you know, people have, you know, a lot of um, maybe insecurities and, you know, when pe people feel threatened, that's when, you know, these insecurities become harder or, or if anything, greater. And, um, and it's difficult because you try to unite people, but when you see people that are dividing others, like it's, it's like, I think for a person that's trying to be a, a Catholic or is interested, they see all, the, all these negative things and it becomes harder for them to even join. They're like, well, why would I want to join this when, you know, there's so much abuse, sexual abuse and all this stuff. And I don't want to be part of that organization because if anything, when you join, um, 
if you become Catholic, uh, you you represent not just yourself but the Catholic faith, and that kind of goes bad. Like it goes downside because then you think you're also representing. People would say, "Well, I'm a Catholic. Oh, you you must be a defense, um, or what do you call it? Um, uh, you must be defending." The priests that abuse kids and things like that and it's just like no not on, on the contrary like like i i take ownership of what i do and if there's mistakes that are made they should be cleared out in this case i know pope francis has been doing a lot with um taking care of all that with uh i think the project that he had and a lot of these churches followed after is protect our god protect god's children i think um it's like you know a good um it's when they started doing background checks and all that stuff which i'm really happy about because yeah like if anything we are not protecting our people if anything the most vulnerable and um and it, it's a challenge and twitter and the social media is just um beasts of their own you know no matter how much you want to spread the gospel there's always that one person that's gonna you know say something wrong about the church and and if you have kids that already have Twitter or social media, they're going to see things that are really difficult to see, especially at now. When when I was younger, the only thing I worried about was playing video games, you know, Super Mario, um, you know, whatever that sports. I didn't have social media. Here, these kids nowadays have social media at a young age, and they're seeing things that are too advanced, I think. You know, um, I've heard about... Uh, um, stories about games like uh, Roblox, I think that's what it's called, and having a lot of um, like pedophiles or, you know, these people that have, um, you know, I think mentalities or ideologies that are kind of ill or twisted about, you know, wanting to attract kids and things like that and using those platforms to kind of get to kids. And you think, you know, it's a game, it's not nothing wrong, but there's some people that are kind of a little bit twisted, you know, and um, and it's, it's nasty. It's, it's, uh, it's really, really weird and scary, I think, as a parent. Roblox is a sour subject in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, my son used to have Roblox. This was about three years ago. And I was watching him play. And I saw that he kept closing this ad out. And so I just watched him like, what's this ad that he keeps closing out? It was an ad for a porn site. Oh, geez. On Roblox. And so my kids are like, it's not on there anymore. I'm like, yeah, but like you just said, there's all these pedophiles going on pretending to be someone. So I'm like, no, um, I will get you games on your, on your switch. I'll get you games on Wii U, uh, whatever the case is. I'll buy them on, on my phone. You could play them, but I'm not getting Roblox because one, I don't want you to see porn ads. Right. And second, and I don't know who's out there. I know your cousins are playing it and that's up between them and their parents. But for me and you, I'm sorry, <laughs> we can do other stuff. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's hard. And I think as a parent, um, you know, you think about that and I think more than anything as a son being involved with like, you know, video games and, you know, you're trying to play a good game and nowadays games are a lot, a lot more uh, realistic. And I think, more than anything, being a, you know, being a military vet, um, you know, there's Call of Duty, um, you know, all those games are about shooting and, and I don't think it's, um, it's a sin to play these games because it is a game, but I think it has to be appropriate age, you know, um, unfortunately, they're not making games at a teenage level anymore. Everything is adult based and fortunately that sells, you know, um, and I think more than anything that it's, it's challenging as a parent because, you want to give them the best and you buy the game for them to have fun. But behind the doors, we don't know what's going on. Who are these people talking? You know, if it's online now, you know, Call of Duty and these games, they, if they have the online capability and that's reason, one reason I don't play online because I don't, you know, know who's behind and, um, you know, it, it's just uncomfortable sometimes hearing things like that where kids face um, these situations and they're kids, you know, they're learning, they're not, I feel like kind of like um, like evolution or graduation. They they're kids and they're becoming um, adults right away. They're not enjoying the the thing about being kids. You know, as a kid, I remember we would go out into the streets and we would play soccer, football. You know, around this time on the streets and we would get yelled at by our neighbors. You know, it was almost time or at times even I feel like. 
you almost have the cops, you know, call get called on us because we were playing on the streets. And but you know, that's being that was fun. You know, that was as as kids that was, you know we were doing that. And nowadays, you don't see kids outside. Everyone's on their phones, and you, you know they're they're almost breaking their necks because they're all like you know looking down, and it's just scary and, and thinking that these kids are not enjoying their innocence as kids. You know, they're growing too fast. Um, more kids are, you know, uh, drinking um, energy drinks, sleep deprived, uh, and then this pandemic, everything's online. And I, I just can't imagine how difficult that could be because it, you know, you're online already and it, it's just, it's hard, I think. Well, yeah, my kids are doing virtual learning, all four of them. And so it's all online. Yeah. And then what do you, and then over the last couple of weeks, I've tried to make a conscious effort just to take them to the park down the street. Cause in our, in our neighborhood, there's a couple of different parks, thank, thankfully. So they can go outside and just play. Mm-hmm. We left all the electronics at home, except for my phone in case you know, my wife called or whatever, but they were just out playing, running around. Yeah. I mean, we found a boomerang and we were just throwing the boomerang around, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think definitely we have to get the kids. There's nothing wrong with being online. I mean, it's definitely, there's a lot of great resources out there. You could have a lot of good fun. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. But you have to have a balance. You have to let them be kids, let them enjoy the outdoors a little bit, get them reading, uh, maybe establish a reading time. That's what I try to get my kids to do as well, at least 20 minutes a day, um, just to get them off these dumb YouTube videos about other kids playing with oh, toys. Geez which I don't understand, yeah. but, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, there's a lot of things out there just to, as parents, we have to create balance. Yeah. And I think too, kind of going back to the adults and uh, as us, uh, as parents is, you know, we might not have time to go to church or maybe pray a rosary, but I'd say, and what's been working for me is, um, I, uh, during quarantine, you know, they told me, uh, the C- C- CDC or, um, our health department would follow up with us and just kind of monitor our symptoms and say every once in a while they'll call us and say, how are you doing, um, you know, and all that. And they told me that I couldn't go out for a walk, like around the block. And I, you know, I get it because the prevent spread and, you know, all that. So I'm like, okay, well, luckily, you know, thank God for Amazon because I bought a, an exercise bike, fairly just simple, nothing, not the, the Pluton or anything like that. That was, you know, it was just hundred dollar bicycle just so we can get something, you know, the blood flow going. And um, I set it up downstairs with my, you know, basic gym, the little gym set. And that's where I hope I can do my podcast too down there. Cause I, with this light, it's nice, but I, you know, nobody can see me. Uh, but anyways, so I set it up and, and I, um, and I talked to a priest of mine, a good friend of mine and we do follow up. He lives in Colombia. Um, and so we just check and see how things are, uh, you know, how things are going. And I asked him, I told him about my, about this, like having difficulty praying. And he said, you know, do something, if you do something already, do it in prayer, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, that, that's a good idea, you know, um, any activity and just put it in prayer. And so I started doing the bike um, for like 10, 15 minutes. And then during that time, I would pray at least no music and just put a rosary on and just ride the bike, but also in prayer. And then I took, um, I, I've been trying to read uh, St. Thomas's uh, Summa, you know, and I have Good a luck. Little, yeah, <laughs> it's a challenge. It's it's huge. It's I got uh, on Amazon. I got a Summa of a Summa. I forgot the name of the the author. So it's like a summary of the big summary. But I had it downstairs. I left it in my bike. So now every time I read or every time I'm working out, um, I can read it. It's the only time that I have more comfortable. I can't read it at night anymore because of the baby and all these things. And you know, at school, so I figure when I'm downstairs, I'll use that time to read, or I can bring my Bible and just read. And you know, I, I don't think it's illegal because you're still doing something, and plus you're you know, you're still staying in tune with your faith. And uh, and I would say do that. Uh, when I used to uh, wash my car outside, I would either pray while I was washing the car. It might be a little unorthodox, but do what helps you. I used to pray calling, you know, mowing the, the lawn. Um, and I had like hours to do it. I would just, you know, pray and just make sure I didn't, um, you know, I wasn't doing anything else and, you know, making sure I was aware of my surroundings, but 
So I would tell people like, do what you're doing already. If you're working out or if you're running or, you know, whatever else, even cooking, pray, you know, pray, offer this activity for someone because I think more than anything, it's never, um, it's never going to go away. Prayer, especially praying for someone, it's never going to go away. It's always offered, even for people that passed away. Uh, one of the podcasters that I um, listen to is um, Jimmy Atkins, mm-hmm. um, you know, in a serious world. And one of the things he mentions is that when there's murderers, because he'll talk about like, you know, people that have uh, killed like shooters or famous murderers, he says, pray for their souls. Even if it was like a hundred years ago, still pray for them. And I think, yeah, why not? You know, pray for the people that as much as I think we pray for the good people, let's pray for those bad people too, or people that have been lost. Because in psychology, um, I, 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 uh, I like looking at people's past histories of maybe misfortunes and all that. And I feel that there's not really an evil person that's born. Um, I think it's, you're a product of your environment, you know, and if you hang out with a lot of bad people, gangsters or, you know, or um, just bad folks, it's because you're, you know, you're going to become like that because it's what you're, you know, hanging around with. And unfortunately, um, I think as a parent, it's good to, to be aware of that. So, um, so yeah, that's what I, that's what I've been doing, praying while, you know, doing something. Well, and all that stuff, the spiritual reading, reading all those books, uh, reading scripture. I mean, that's yeah. definitely a form of prayer, especially when reading one of the great saints like Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. When I, I mean, even now I read them, I, um, I've had some experience, but um, even with, just reading him like wow like this guy's like next level like right. he's here i'm like way down here <laughs> and i'm trying to get up here you know right um but he, he says so many great things and what i like at, le- at least in the copy i don't know about your your copy but in the copies mm-hmm. of the summa that i've read he lists the like councils or at least the editor does the scripture passages he's talking about yeah. you could always go back and reference those as well right to get a better idea but spiritual reading and i think a lot of people and they don't they don't think that as a type of prayer but you're still growing spiritually and that's what prayer is about is developing that relationship with our creator and keeping in there's been i mean the church has been around for two thousand years mm-hmm. i mean there's i mean tons of great intellectuals that came before us uh, right. tons of tons of great teachers that came before us and all that it's a it's a data mine we can still harvest right it, it's challenging uh, it's challenging but i think it's a blessing that we have so much to look into like it's not like we have one just the bible there's so many good um so many good uh, characters you know a lot of good people that have come before us and have influence in a good way, you know, looking, if I've been, I, I tell people, if, if you don't know who, if you don't want to read the Bible, because I don't know, like personal choice, and you want to learn about the faith, I would say, look at the saints, look at how they live, they, they're not perfect, you know, the church isn't for perfect people, it's, it's a hospital for sinners, you know, we're trying to recuperate, um, we're trying to heal, we're trying to, if anything, try to um, cleanse ourselves, and I know you mentioned earlier that um, when you go to church and after church, it's not the end of the world. Like, it's not just it ends there. You go out and though I think one of the final words, the priest says, go out and spread the gospel, you know, and, and I think that's what we should do, you know, and I think as a Catholic man, uh, Catholic dad, that's where I think we put in our effort. And I think um, it's something that we don't maybe do it as much anymore. You know, we, I don't know about you, uh, William, but how do you, I mean, with your friends, and if they're not Catholic friends, do you talk about your faith outside with your, you know, social circle, social circles? Oh, all the time. Um, a very, I mean, not only on Twitter, but on, on Facebook and a lot of my Facebook friends, I mean, they're, I have people from all over the world that are Facebook friends, you know, friends quotations, right. <laughs> but um, I have a good amount that I was friends with back in my Protestant days as well. And I'll post something and then they ask questions or if they have a question about the faith, like they'll message me. Like I had, I had a, just about a week ago, I had a, 
uh, pastor in Georgia e um, send me a message, a messenger, like, what, is the, what does the Catholic Church believe about the Bible? I was like, it's the inerrant word of God. Right. He's, like, he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, that's the church teaching on what the Bible is. He's like, okay, great. I wasn't sure, but thanks for clarifying that. Just being open to those questions so that all, all everyone knows if they have a question, they could ask me. Okay. And it doesn't matter. I'm not trying to debate anyone. And nine times out of 10, they're not trying to debate me either. Sometimes it gets into a good dialogue, but we all have a uh, good respect. Like, I don't know if you remember, like, uh, was it three, four weeks ago, the mass readings were from the book of Galatians. Okay. And St. Paul's talking about, oh, foolish Galatians, you know, we're saved by faith, not by the works of the law. And I posted a picture of that. And one of my oh, Protestant, yeah. and one of my Protestant friends was like, you see, Paul was a Protestant. I'm like, no, no, you're not understanding what Paul's talking about here. And so we just had a discussion about that. And so mm -hmm. we got to a bit, he got up to a better understanding of what the Catholic position is. And he said, look, when, when this whole pandemic's over, let's go out for a beer and let's talk about it more. Yeah. Great. Let's go for it. Yeah. I like beer. I like talking about theology. Let's do it. And so yeah, does he. Beer, so, <laughs> right, right. Beer is the Bible, but, you know? I think we, as long as we're, you know, St. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, you know, be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Right. And as long as we're, I think sometimes people forget that gentleness and respect part. Mm-hmm. But if people know that we're going to give them an answer, but it's going to be a respectful answer, we're not going to say that they're stupid for asking it or something like that. Right. They can ask questions about the faith. They feel safe about asking questions about the faith. And it's a great form of evangelization. And that's what we're called yeah. to do. We're called to, like you said, go forth and live the gospel with your life. Yeah, we live the gospel with our life. And then people are going to start asking questions. Yeah. And then we have to be able to answer those questions in a respectful way where people are still going to want to learn about the faith. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, and I think with social media, sometimes that gets lost, but yeah. that's still, that's still the goal. That's what Jesus tells us to do. You know, the great commission, you know, go forth, teach everything I've commanded you. And, you know, I'm with you always, even through the end of the age. And there's yeah. a lot of different ways we could teach that. Right, and I was going to say that we lost the art of dialogue. You know, I think that's one of the beginning podcast episodes that I talked about was um, during the whole, like, uh, I guess the term or the, the word racism kind of went up, like, all over the place. And, you know, and I, and, and I think that um, we don't talk about this. We don't talk in general. We are, we, we're more about um, trying to get our, our point across and winning pride like i beat you in the debate you know we have people that are like trying to um be like ben shapiro's or we're trying to have people that are like um you know like all kinds of figures um that are that are good at debating but who knows what the message is trying to get across you know are you trying to divide or are you trying to unify and you might be good in one thing but you know you have people that are um you know they're kind of all over the place and and as much as you can be, you can be a good debater. You can be, you know, if you're in practicing law or anything like that. But if in general, we should, you know, I think we lose the, the faith of, of reason when you talk to people. I, um, like an example is, again, Twitter in the, in the, what do you call it? <clears throat> the people that, uh, the, I guess you can say Latinos, um, because there, that's another part of the, the, situation that are a lot of the group of people that I follow is they um, they attack the Catholics, especially the Catholic um, family that's majority of Latinos, they attack the what they call the progressives. Um, you know, they're pro-choice and, and it's just a, a whole situation that they attack, you know, all these people that are different and they're just debating and they have it's almost like they wear a badge of honor that they want to debate and that's it. I'm like, great. You want to debate, but what happened? What did you get across? Are you spreading the gospel? Or are you spreading differences? Hate, you know? And so one example is um, the pro-choice, pro-life, you know, I think 
that in a sense is a beast of its own because you can never really win if anything because if people don't understand or they're not empathic they're not gonna you're not gonna really win fully you know i think the the win is when both people realize that we both have flaws but we can work together reason is for example um you know pro-life all about life and you know having the baby from womb to tomb as they say or uh, conceptional exception and then pro-choice you know women's rights um, and this are my body my choice and and all this but we as a pro-life you think about okay like the baby all the way okay great you know has to be born but then what are you doing after you know i think as a dad you you want to instill faith in your child but also you want to instill uh, knowledge and understanding that if you say one thing, you kind of have to follow the consequences after. So if you save a baby, what's going to happen? You know, are you going to take care of the baby? Um, you know, we should create resources for that person, you know, for the, for the mom in this case. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to just save the baby and forget about the mom, right? You want to help the mom go through, um, you know, the, if there's going to be um, like an orphan, orphanage process or you know, something, foster care, whatever the situation is, you know, you don't want to just leave the child behind or leave the mom behind. You, you know, there is a process you got to take care. You know, there's responsibilities after that. Um, if you're pro-choice, you know, people will forget that if, you know, a woman, um, you know, has an abortion, that it's over. No, there's been studies that show that women that some, some women that have abortions, um, you know, I can't cite the facts right now, but I know if, if you look it up in research that there's a lot of uh, depression, a lot of mental health that gets affected, you know, but yet pro-choice people, sometimes they don't realize that they just want to win that part and then that's it. Like, are you going to do, are you going to help that mom to take care of her, like mentally? You know, are you going to be with her after all that? Because some people, you know, I think it's all about in the moment, you want to just win your fact and that's it, but there's consequences to everything. If you're pro-life, then you know, what happens to the child? You know, if you're pro-choice, what happens to the mom? But in general, what happens to the guys? And I think guys should also take ownership. If you're gonna have a child and you're instilling in, in your, um, you know, forcing your, the woman to have an abortion, I think there should also be consequences for the man because you're part of this process. The woman shouldn't be the one that carries all this weight, you know? And if you're pro-life and, you know, you wanna have the baby, you want, you know, the mom to have the baby, then, be a good parent and, you know, um, even if, it, if you require therapy, go for therapy, you know, work together to keep this child together because it is a process. It's, it's trauma-based, you know, and, um, and I always say, and people don't like it, but I'm like, if you don't want to, to win both debates, if you want to have, um, you know, sex, uh, use the protection, you know, know your consequences. There's, you know, but then that's a whole different situation. But I'm, what I'm, grind, I'm trying to get to is that, you know, there's always going to be debates for no matter what situation. And as a parent, it's hard, especially when your kids are going to grow up. And, you know, um, and I'm, I know that you're going to be, your kids are closer to getting to teenagers and adults um, than my, my child. But um, we see a lot of that division, you know, and uh, I think more than anything, um, it's either going to restore your faith in, your family or it's either gonna divide it because you know you're maybe your kids are more liberal now you know i was kind of a little a little bit of of skeptical i would say i i wanted to go against the church and i wanted to see why these things were happening and all these nasty things behind the doors but i later i soon realized that you know the, the church needs people that are i think skeptical because they're the ones that I feel God is giving you that, that grace of, you know, um, you're, you're uh, not just following orders or following a certain custom, but you're thinking more. You're trying, trying to figure out why, you know, why is this happening, you know, and I want to become, I want, I want the church to become better. So, you know, you kind of start little by little having that, that uh, instillment of, okay, you know, like um, the church isn't growing because of all these cases of maybe the abuse or, you know, people are becoming more, I don't know, there's more um, new age era, a new, or I'm sorry, new age, like spirituality, you know, and so it, it's, it's challenging, but I think um, 
when anything, uh, you know, just trying to stick to yourself, you know, your, you know, what your morals are and your ethics in this case, you know. Um, so I, I don't know. If, um, I mean, what do you think about that one? Like when you have situations like that, especially when you see that on Twitter, you know, all these debates again. And as a father, how do you help your child? I love debates. I watch a lot of debates. So I've watched, you know, debates by Trent Horn with Gary Machuda okay. and, and all these guys. There's a difference between a, a debate in those settings than it is online. So I go back to when, when, I, when Trent Horn debates on Twitter, because he'll do that sometimes. He yeah. asks back and forth questions, but they're all respectful questions. And, and I was watching one it was an overview of one of his debates with Steve Christie, who's a Protestant, and he was on Gary Machuda's channel, Apocrypha Apocalypse. And he's like, I debate for the people that aren't sure and just to get information, but I do, I try to do it in a respectful manner. Um, and I'm summarizing what he says here because it's not about winning the argument, it's about, you know, souls in the end. And yeah. that's and it's kind of what. That's kind of what I try to do as well. I honestly, I used to debate a lot more. I just don't have time, but it was yeah. always try to be respectful. It's not about winning an argument. If we're, if our focus is on winning the argument, it's the wrong focus because the focus right. should be bringing people to the to Christ. And when we're right. focused on winning the argument, we're not going to get there. Right. It's, we're trying to evangelize, or are we trying to destroy? Right. No, it's it's um it's a it's a whole you know beast of its own and. And, um, you know, I think at the end, it's like, we have a lot of flaws and unfortunately, you know, um, situations like pro-choice, pro-life, um, like Catholic church, the Protestant churches, uh, the Muslim faith, all these things, you know, it's, I think there's going to be a lot of division and there's always going to be division, but I think is how do we react? And I think when people know how you react, it's how you build your character, you know, you've, if you've gone through those, you know, tough moments, I think it's either going to help you, it's either going to build you or it's going to destroy you, you know, and, and more than anything, sticking to your faith. I think your uh, the Bible has a lot of good knowledge and St. Thomas is a good person about that. We're talking about, um, like, in his book, The Summa, he, I like how he, um, he brings up objections, like, possibly if there's a question, like, is God... Uh, a person or something, you know, something, situ some situation or question like that. But then he brings reasons about um, why he isn't this way, but then why he is. So like he, he provides good evidence, you know, he, he objectifies the situation, but then he also brings like supports, like why he believes it, it could be the answers. And I think that's how we need to do more. We need to try to connect with people, um, know their differences, but more than anything, try to understand the differences you know if they don't want to believe or whatever then let it be you know maybe that's their in, in um at work or in psychology in social work really um part of the therapy is knowing where the, where the person is at and you can be giving them loads of information you want to do all this but if they're not ready for that they're not ready you know there's nothing really we can do mentally that's where they're where they're at and it's hard, but I think if you respect that part, maybe, you know, I'm like in this, uh, in some cases I've met people that are not Catholic, but they say, you know what, like, I enjoy talking with you because you're not, you're not attacking me. And I've learned to become a better person, a better uh, Catholic, because I used to have this ideology that, you know, if you're a Christian, like from a different Protestant, like if you're a Protestant, that, you know, our church or the Catholic church was the best one and all this stuff. And I was very ignorant about it. I learned, I went through my journey and learned that, you know, I'm not, it's not about winning or losing. It's about, you know, um, really trying to help people. You know, there's been a lot of good people that I've met that are not Catholic. They're not spiritual people, you know, or they're not religious people. And I've met a, a horrible people or kind of bogus people that are very religious, you know, and, and I think that makes a big difference because that reflects on how the church is. If you, if you're going to church and you know, and I get it, you know, moderation, you can party, you can drink and this and that. But if you're out there and doing, you know, some really weird things and just all these, you know, temptations, I should say, 
um, not only are you hurting yourself, you're hurting the church because people really pay attention to what's going on, you know, and unfortunately, you know, we might think that it's the church um, and more than anything, it's, you know, as a character or as a person, you're building your character and you're helping restore the faith in that case. Right, and like, like what you said with Thomas in the Summa, he lists the question, he lists the objection, he lists his answer. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he knows he's, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is we have, we don't want to misportray someone else's argument. We don't want to put words into their mouth. Let's right. understand exactly what they're saying. We do that by asking questions that we do it by asking questions in a respectable manner. And, you know, not everyone, not everyone has the same, like you go back to pro-life, pro-choice, not everyone, yeah. even within those camps, not everyone is, believes the same, for example. Right. Okay. So we have to, we ask questions. We have to understand the arguments. And it goes, it goes back to our faith as well. You said, our, you said a moment ago, our kids are on social media now. They're seeing all these things. Have we cultivated an environment with our children, with our family, with our friends, where they can come to us to ask these questions? Like, mm -hmm. what about this? You know, for example, and if not, why? And I think it may say a lot to how we maybe portrayed ourselves if they're yeah. not willing to come to us. Yeah, I, I think that's good because uh, in, in the end, no matter what your stance is and anything, and your kids might have a difference, if you're open to listening to your kids, um, you're not at least you're not going to lose your kids because if you have your own, you know, I don't know, your own mentality, your own ideology, and you know, you're really hard on it like a rock, like this is what I believe, you're going to drive people away from you. In the end, family comes first. You might have a difference, but I think that's what becomes a family. That's what creates a family when you know that there's a lot of, um, a lot of division. But and if anything, you know, your kids are going to be your kids for the rest of your life. You never stop being a parent. And um, as long, I think, if you still understanding and empathy, your kids might say, you know, I'm blue or I'm orange, and you're, you know, red or you're, you know, uh, green. Whatever the situation is. In the end, they understand, they'll respect that and say, you know what, we, we come across differences right now, but you're still my dad. I still want to be with you. You're still my mom. I still want to be with you. I'm going to hang out with you. Let's learn to live together, even though we have differences, you know, and, and I think that's in general, I think more than anything, when you're a domestic, when you're um, a Catholic dad, um, the domestic church goes <coughs> down, you know, you know uh, on the problem. Um, you know, the domestic church comes around, comes above everything else. I think we are, you know, um, as they say, we're the, we're the prophet, we're the priest, we're the king. And, and more than anything also, um, you know, that's, that's the general term, right? Their general sense is that you, you have to instill, or you, you try to instill these good values to your kids, but if anything, if they're not going to follow the faith, and still being a, still a good dad, you know, uh, and I think that's what makes a good Catholic dad is that you're still working together. You know, you're still there. You're going to help them. You're going to give them discipline, um, but not like a whole, you know, um, like beat them or anything like that, you know, but if it, cause you don't want to, you know, not the spankings, but you know, being able to yeah. tell them when they did something wrong, you know, I think that comes around too is telling them something when they did something wrong. And, and I think that another thing that we can probably talk about, and this could be maybe in the future is, how to be a good Catholic husband, you know, because right now we talk more about kids and the domestic church, but domestic, I think uh, a Catholic husband is another topic that can go above and beyond with that because that's, uh, that's hard too, I think more than anything, but um, you know, that in, in a general sense, I think just being a good Catholic person requires a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of work on yourself, you know, it definitely and maybe we can close with this because i know zoom has given us yeah. the countdown but you said our kids are with us our whole life there's a deacon at my church he's about 85 years old god bless him still active he's nice. been active in the church forever but his kids don't attend mass and mm -hmm. it, it does break his heart when he talks about it you could see you could see it in his face he's like but he's like you know what and he calls me a young man <laughs> uh, 
he's a young man. I, I always pray for my kids. And whenever they're in town, I invite, I invite them to come to mass with me. No matter what, I always invite them. So I think it's something we can take away. If people are falling away, we could reach out. We can invite them. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was a misconception on something. My mom, I guess my mom, and maybe my mom, maybe example is she's a, she grew up in the Catholic church. She's no longer Catholic. Okay. But um, she'll come to me with questions. She's like, and I don't know where she got this. I don't, I don't know. But she's like, why do you guys worship the Pope? I'm like, well, we don't mom. And this happened several <laughs> years. This, yeah. And this, ha this happened several years ago, but I, it was probably a misconception from when she was little saying, you know, what the Pope says goes maybe not defining what papal infallibility actually is. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of misconceptions and I, what my deacon says just rings true. Always pray for your children. And, you know, yes, they're right now they're in our care so we can bring them to mass, but how about when they're, when they're older, we can still right. invite them. We can still invite them if we haven't seen them in a while or because the church is always open. The domestic church is always open. Don't get me wrong. Right now, some of our churches are closed down because of COVID. Right. But the church has not closed. The church is That's still true. going. There's still ministry happening. Right. It's. I think more than anything, um, you know, we are the church. It, uh, I forgot the, the, um, the scripture, but something in the Bible, it says that where there's two people praying, that's where I am. Um, if I can remember something like that. And I think that's true. You know, when you pray with your kids, uh, with your wife, uh, with your partner, husband, even if it's, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, um, you know, if you're not married, but you're living together, I know that's another stigma to it, but if you're praying and you're trying to be good, hey, that's that's good enough, I think, because um, we need good right now. We, we don't need differences. We need, we need unity, and, um, and I think praying for each other is going to be a big thing and inviting people. I, so I've heard so many stories that people say, well, you know, I've never gotten invited to a church, and I'm like, why, you know, like, let's invite people instead of attacking them, invite them, you know, bring them closer to you, you know, don't, don't uh, keep them away from this opportunity. I think it's, it's a, it's a good opportunity. I've, I mean, I've gone to uh, other churches that are um, not Catholic for school and just uh, because someone invited me to, I'm like, you know what, it's an invitation. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I had a, a funny story. Um, I think there were uh, letter day saints. Uh, one of the guys was, he saw my car and he was like, oh man, that's a nice car. So I had my uh, central, like, you know, um, pretty much modified, hooked up, you know, looking nice and stuff. And he was walking on with this other guy and, you know, they were just going around and knocking on the doors. And there's a whole, whole con bad conception of that too, that, you know, don't open the doors because they're going to convert you, at least in the Latino community. There's like this whole thing, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and there's some good people out there, you know, I'm not going to lie. And, uh, and I was like, hey, uh, and he came over to me, talked to me. He's like, hey, uh, you know, would you be interested in, in uh, checking out the church? And I was like, yeah, uh, I'll do that. Before, if it was like five years, 10 years ago, I'd probably say no. Five years ago, I'd probably be like, oh, it's, you know, weird about it. But I think now as you learn, you have the spiritual maturity. Um, and you're like, yeah, I would uh, let me know where your church is. But, you know, go to my church first. They never came to my church. So I'm like, okay, you know, I'm like, if you want to, if you want to help people come to your church, like, I think it would be a good deal. You invite them and I'll go to yours. And it's a respectful thing. It's like, let me learn. I think more than anything, learning, learning about each other's culture. Um, if anything, like if someone invites you, you know, I would hope that expect an invite back because that builds, if anything, if you're not going to evangelize the person, you're evangelizing the community to become a better community, you know? Uh, it's, a community doesn't mean that you're going to have everyone be the same faith, but they're going to be good neighbors. And if anything, it's part of the commandments, be, you know, be a, be a good uh, neighbor. With uh, COVID, um, just a quick uh, story, my neighbor, you know, he knew that we had COVID, so he would help us put our garbage back in, um, in our, um, our garbage cans back in our backyard. And, you know, and that was kind of cool. You know, he, he, he's, I don't think he's uh, practicing Catholic, but um He's still helpful. I think, if anything, that's good morals, you know, uh, just being a good person and by doing little things like that, you know, saying hi to people, starting conversations like, hey, how's it going? And I think more than anything, um, you know, that's the goal is to, to restore faith in humanity, as they always say online. But I think by doing little things like that, it's what helps, you know, honestly. 
Well, Cesar, it's been great uh, talking with you. I know we talked a while and Zoom has given us the countdown. So, um, so God bless you. And thanks for, um, thanks for coming on with me. Uh, you too, William. Thank you. And hopefully, you know, we'll have a part two to this and uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day and, you know, God bless. All right. You too. Thank